We're going to continue in our series, and I, I think this is going to be the last one. Never say never, um, but the last in our series on um, pursuing God. Who's been enjoying it? Yeah, it's uh, been amazing to see the the uh, intensity we even within our worship rise as we hunger and pursue and seek after God. The last time I preached, I, I said this. I said, intimacy is the primary language of prayer because the primary purpose of prayer is relationship. If you remember back to what I shared, I talked about intimacy being developed, the language of inti- intimacy being developed when we are babies. It's the first language we learn. Anyone remember that? We learn three different types of language. We learn the language of intimacy, the language of information, and the language of motivation. But the first one we learn when we're a little baby, and just Steve's word this morning, it was like going back old school, but it was awesome. He was right on, on target because in his word he talked about um, our father holding us as babies. And that's where we learn intimacy. In that place where our mother or father hold us and we cry out to them for n- in our need, if we're hungry or maybe even if when Damien was a baby, when his nappy was dirty, and, uh, which was often, is that right? <laughs> yes. Uh, and the, the fact that it would cry out in our discomfort and, we, and our mother or our father would come to us and hold us and comfort us. And in that moment of vulnerability, when we're vulnerable before God and, and, and vulnerable before our parents, what happens, they tell us, is we begin to bond. There's a bond that comes between child and parent, child and caregiver. As we're vulnerable and, and cry out in our place of need, our parent comforts us and there's a bond that happens. And who understands, and, and we see as we grow older, even most of our Strong relationships come from a place of vulnerability. When we're vulnerable with someone in a place of need or a place of, of trouble and we, make, we share it with someone and there's a bond that happens that can't be broken. And um, Jesus encourages us in this language of intimacy when it comes to prayer. When he taught us how to pray, He taught us those powerful words, when you pray, say, our Father. Now, we've made that into a religious, like, woo, moment. But the reality of our Father is, if you translate it in the original language, our Father simply means, it's it's a loving term, it's a term of dearest Father. If we were to use that term in our modern day terms, it would be like Dad. Like my kids cry out to me and say, hey, Dad, can you help me with this? Or can you, hey, Dad, what are you doing at the moment? I need a hand or whatever it is. But it's, that, it's, a, it's a relational type of language. It's the language of intimacy. Because pursuing God in prayer at its most basic is us at our most basic. It's us acknowledging that God is our Father. And that he is our source for all things. And in him, we find all things. And that in in our need of him, everything is possible. And so today, what I want to do is I want to look at an actual biblical example of someone who prays intimately with God. Now, you might be surprised at who I choose, but... This person shows us that the kind of language that is necessary, the kind of what intimate language looks like when we're praying to God. Their prayers are found in the Bible and they show an incredible vulnerability before God. They show a a hunger for God like no one else. And uh, it's an amazing example for us to follow. Anyone got any idea who I might be talking about? Nonna, she's not in the Bible. <laughs> I know she's old, but she's not that old. <laughs> Gee. <laughs> You're in another place. Anyone got an idea? Other than Judy, anyone else got an idea? 
Jesus is a good one, but it's not Jesus, no. Larissa, on the money. Did you see my notes? No. Da- King David. We're going to look at King David. Did you say that, Joyce? Oh, well done. So King David is who I want us to look at, and the, his prayers are found in the book of Psalms. Who loves the book of Psalms? It's a great book of the Bible. There are 150 chapters in the book of Psalms. Now, of those 150 chapters... 73 are either written by David or written for David or written about David. Uh, My maths is not great, but that's almost half. Pretty close to half of the Psalms David was involved in in some way. And as we know, David was the only person in the Bible that was described as a man after God's own heart. And I believe that's because he was pursuing God and God's heart in prayer, and it was his absolute priority in his life. So tonight, today, I want to share with you three things we can learn from David about intimate prayer. Anyone up for that? You with me? Lessons from King David on intimate prayer. Sound good? All right, number one, King David was ordinary when it came to intimate prayer. Now you go, what are you talking about, Ben? That makes no sense. He's a king. Kings aren't ordinary. I can't believe the amount of fuss made about the queen going to hospital. Can you believe that? I don't. That's just, sorry, might be too many royalists here. But, um, <laughs> but the fact is, kings are very important people, obviously. And we know about king, king David. He did some amazing things, some incredible things. He slayed a giant with a sling. Isn't that right? He conquered nations. He did incredible things. He, he ruled uh, Israel and he, he was described as one of the most prosperous times in the nation's history. But when it, when it comes to prayer, we need to understand that David, in the culture of his day, the Israeli culture, the Jewish culture, David was what we would describe as only a lay person. Even as king, he was not someone their culture would respect when it came to the idea of praying. You see, in Jewish culture, there were three key people who they looked to for prayer. There was the priests, obviously. Then there was the prophets who prayed. And the others were what they described as wise men. And guess what? David was none of those. So that, you think about it, the think about the things that David was. He wasn't a priest, he wasn't a prophet, and he wasn't a wise man. But he was a shepherd. Now, shepherds were definitely not known for praying. They were were actually considered the lowest of the low in that society. Shepherds weren't even allowed to give testimony in court because they were considered, you know, unscrupulous and not not nice people. So David was a shepherd, so definitely not not a prayer as a shepherd. The second thing he was was a warrior. He was a soldier. He was a man of war. He slayed a giant. He took Israel into battle numbers of times to conquer territory. So who knows that warriors aren't known for their prayer. Isn't that right? The other thing he was known for was being a musician. Now, obviously, our musicians are wonderful and pray. But the majority of musicians don't care about praying. They just care about being on the stage and performing. Isn't that right? No? (laughs) You're not a real musician. You're a bass player, <laughs> David. Bass. It's like just a little bit above drummer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just lost Des. He's gone. Get up and go. <laughs> no, but the reality is musicians, they're not known for prayer, are they? They're known for performing and music. And the other thing we know David was he was king, so he was a politician in their day. And he, politicians, who knows, who would say politicians aren't known for prayer? Isn't that right? Most of us struggle with our politicians because they don't pray. And so the reality is, all of these roles um, that were known for praying, David wasn't. He wasn't a priest, he wasn't a prophet, he wasn't a wise man. But at the same time, 
David didn't allow that to stop him from praying. And we have a legacy of David's prayer in the book of Psalms. And that, what that tells me is that the incredible thing about David was that he didn't allow the cultural norms of his day to dictate to him what his relationship with God and his prayer life was like. Say that again. David didn't allow the cultural norms of his day that would tell him, you're not a prayer, so don't pray. Leave that up to the priests. Leave that up to the prophets. Leave that up to those religious people. But David didn't take that and he didn't allow that to dictate to him whether he would pray or not. And this is really important for us to understand because too often as a pastor, I have people come to me and say, I can't pray because I'm not a pastor like you. I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to pray. I don't know what prayer, how I can do it. And, and David shows us really clearly that our position does not determine our ability to pray. Every person here, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, has the ability to connect with God intimately in prayer. David gives us an incredible example that the, that the place of intimacy with God in prayer is available to all of us. And that's not dependent on if we have a th theological degree or not. It, it's not dependent on who we are or what we've done. It's dependent on the fact that God wants to have relationship with us. Tanya shared so beautifully around communion about grace. And the thing that we know in this day and age, even more so than when David was around, we live in the age of grace, where Jesus died on a cross so that we could have open access to God. That there is no longer anything that separates us from the presence of God. Jesus has dealt with the sin issue. And so now we, the Bible tells us we can enter God's throne room boldly. It doesn't say just pastors can do that or holy people. It says every one of us who put our faith in Jesus Christ can enter God's throne room boldly. How good is that? Paul shows us this idea really powerfully in Corinthians, this idea that God wants relationship with every single one of us. In 1, 1 Corinthians 26 to 29, he says, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God deliberately chose the things the world considers foolish in order to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose those who were powerless to shame those who were powerful. And he chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important, so that no one can ever boast in the presence of God. That tells me that every one of us can pray and have an intimate relationship with God. David's an incredible example that, of that. Even as a shepherd boy, he rose to the place of king, but he also had an intimate, prayerful relationship with God. The second thing we learn about David is that intimate prayer is born out of trouble. David learnt to connect intimately with God because David was never far away from trouble or problems. You know, out of the 73 Psalms connected to David's life, there are 13 where they actually refer to specific moments in David's life. And all of these moments were times of trouble and conflict. I think that should be a source of encouragement to us. Because even a man after God's own heart had times of trouble, had times of difficulty. Now, some of these troubles were obviously inflicted on him by others. He had enemies. He had people who wanted to get rid of him. And others of these troubles were actually inflicted upon him by himself, by his own mistakes. And so we're going to look at a few of these, a few examples. They're up there. Psalm 3, David talks of the 
praise around the story of his son Absalom when he had to flee from his son. If you know the story, his son did a coup and took over the kingdom from David. And David had to run for his life because his son wanted to kill him. That's a pretty problematic situation, isn't it? A bit of a problem. Psalm 18, it talks about when the Lord delivered David from the hand of Saul. When Saul was trying to kill him and he, he, was mani- he managed to escape. Because the king of the time was jealous of him and didn't want him to take his place. Psalm 51, one of the most significant stories of David's life, was when Nathan the prophet came to him concerning his adulterous affair with Bathsheba and his conspiracy to murder her husband Uriah. Psalm 52 and 54 talks of when friends of David betrayed him to Saul betrayed his hiding place where he was hiding to Saul. And so even his friends turned against him. Psalm 56 talks of the time where he cries out to God because the Philistines had seized him and taken him captive. Psalm 57 and 142 talks of the time for a long time, for nearly over 10, 15 years, David had to hide in a cave from Saul. And so it it talks of that trouble where he had to live in a cave just to survive and he cried out to God in prayer. And the final one in Psalm 63 was when he fled to the wilderness of Judah to get away from his enemies. And the exciting thing that we learn about David in these times is not that David was trouble free. David had lots of troubles and difficulties like we all do. But to put it simply, when David was in trouble, his default move, the way he responded to his trouble, was to run to God and pray. He might have run away from his enemies, but incredibly, he never ran away from God. There's a lesson for us to learn here, church. Because too many of us, when we get into trouble or we make mistakes, the first default move of ours is to run away from God. We're like Adam and Eve and like, where can we hide? God's going to be mad at us or whatever. But David shows us that in our times of trouble, what we need to do is run to God. If we read these Psalms, and I encourage you to do it, you, you read the language. It's a language of intimacy where David was constantly reminded of his own insufficiencies and his own lack. But at the same time, As he prayed, he declared God's goodness and God's greatness and that God was his all-sufficiency in his time of trouble and need. You know, all of his troubles were difficult, but one of them, I would say, was top tier. The worst of the worst. Because this man, after God's own heart, number one, committed adultery, but then also conspired to murder the woman's husband, to cover up his mistake. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty bad. That's top tier, as my son would say. And this is the thing, though. To David's credit, when the prophet Nathan came to him and exposed him for what he had done, David did not try to cover it up. Think of another king, King Saul, when God sent the prophet to him to... to uncover what the mistake he made he was like oh i've got this excuse and that excuse and whatever but david said you're right i've done the wrong thing and he faced his trouble he responded to his trouble with complete honesty and vulnerability and in psalm 51 he wrote a prayer to god in this moment of disgrace and trouble And it's a powerful psalm. I'm not going to read it all to you, but I want to read sections of it. Because in the language, I want you to get an idea of what the prayer language of intimacy looks like, what it sounds like. It's not highfalutin and and all glamorous. It's just honest. It's raw. It's vulnerable. And it's just opening your heart and being real with God. And that's all God wants from us when it comes to intimate prayer that we would hide nothing, but we would be transparent and real with him. So 
Psalm 51, verses 1 to 4. David says these words, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. So straight up, he acknowledges God in his great love, but he acknowledges his stuffed up. He's made mistakes. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. In that moment, he takes ownership. It's my iniquity. It's not what someone else has done to me. I wasn't lured in. I did it. It's my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before you. Against you and only you have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. What he's basically saying there is it's, you are the judge of everything and I deserve whatever you determine. Whatever you decide, God, I'll accept your judgment. In verses 9 to 12, he goes on to say, hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. And he says these powerful words, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of not my salvation but your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. You see, in that moment, he's, he's not saying, God, I'll do this for you, and I'll do that for you, and I'll, I'll, you know what, to fix all my mistakes, I'll do this, this. No, he says, God, help me. If I'm going to change, I can't do it in my own strength. Create in me, God, a clean heart. Take not your Holy Spirit from me. I need you, God. You're the answer. You're, I need your salvation, not... I can't save myself in this situation. And then finally in verses 16 and 17, he says these words, You will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. So basically, if I could fix things, I would, but I know it's not going to fix things. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. In other words, what God wants is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. He wants us to come to him in our brokenness. He wants us to come to him and acknowledge, I'm broken. I'm a mess. I've stuffed up. I need your help, God. I love the way Eugene Peterson translates this in the message where he says, going through the motions doesn't please you, God. That's important for us to hear because it's not about rocking up to church every Sunday, putting in our tithes and offerings, doing all this stuff. God doesn't want us to just do stuff. He wants our hearts. Eugene Peterson says, a flawless performance is nothing to you. He knows we know how to put on a show. When we've been caught out, we love to put on a show. But God's not into flawless performances. He's not into perfection like that. He says, I learned God worship when my pride was shattered. How do we enter a relationship with God? When we say, I can't do this, I've failed miserably, God, I humble myself and I ask you for help. I'm sorry for not living with you in my life. And God says, when, when we respond like that, he will save us. He will restore us. He will give us his grace, as Tanya talked about. His abundant grace. His feast of grace. When David wrote this psalm, he hides nothing, but he throws himself totally at the mercy of God's character. He knows he's messed up, but he also knows that God is a God, as he describes, of steadfast love and mercy. David knows that he's been in this place before, places of trouble and places of difficulty. 
And he knows that even though he may have been faithless, he serves a God who is faithful. That he serves a God who will always be there for him. This is the same person who wrote the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He leads me through pastures. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. God, though David knows that God is the only one who can save him, restore him and heal him. And so he humbles himself as king and says, God, I'm sorry, forgive me. That's what intimate prayer looks like. The last thing we learn about David when it comes to intimate prayer is that David prayed because God was his one thing. As I said earlier, I believe David was described as a man after God's own heart because David's heart was totally focused on God's heart. It's important for us to understand that being fully focused on God does not mean you won't have troubles. Being fully focused on God does not mean you won't make mistakes. When I was growing up, I had this idea that if I read my Bible every day, if I prayed every day, if I did the right things every day, that I would be perfect. I, I would be the perfect Christian. That that's what God wanted from me. And I, I know it is what God wanted from me, but what God really wants from me is that I would know him and that I would have relationship with him, that I wouldn't just do rituals and programs to have relationship with him, but his desire is to know me and me to know him. Now, in that place, it makes sense that all of us are going to make mistakes. And that doesn't change our relationship with God. What changes that is how we respond to those mistakes. Are we going to be like David and run to God? Or are we going to go and hide from God? Because this is what David shows us, is that David's main objective, time and time again, no matter what he faced or what he did, he always ran to God. Because God was his one thing. God and knowing God was, was what he was all about. In Psalm 27 verse 4, he says, The one thing I ask of the Lord, the one thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. God was David's one thing. And this is really important because when it comes to prayer, we need to understand this simple thing that David teaches us. It's simple. It's not rocket science. It's simply, it's simply this. Prayer is all about God. It's all about us knowing God. It's all about us having relationship with God. Prayer is all about making God our first priority in our life and involving him in every part of our life. Another man of God said it this way in Philippians 3. This is the Apostle Paul speaking. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things that, that are ahead, which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What is the goal and the upward call and the prize? The goal is to know God. The God goal is to have relationship with God. The goal is to experience, experience intimacy with God. Everybody has a one thing. I'd ask you, what's your one thing? Because we all have it. What is the one thing that is the clear focus of your life? Is it God? Or is it something else? Because our greatest danger in life is permitting 
the urgent things to crowd out the most important things, as we've talked about during this series. It's the big rocks that go in first. But sometimes the little rocks crowd out the big rocks. So many times I talk to people and we sit down and, and they say, oh, I'll give God more time when I sort this out or sort this out or, or get this worked out in my life. But David teaches us that it's the one, it starts with the one thing first, that we get things in the right order first, that we put God first, and then all these things will be added to us. It brings us back to the beginning where we started this series. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. That's making God your one thing, your first thing, the most important thing. I'm going to ask the band to come back. And they're going to lead us in some more worship in a moment. But I want to close with w another of David's psalms. And I want to read it to you. And I'd ask you to close your eyes and listen to the words as I read them. Listen to the heart. And I pray that as, we, as I read them that you would take them on board. That you'd pray, God, help me to put you first. Help me to long after you. Maybe there's people here that you don't know God and you've never asked him into your life. You've never invited him to be a part of your life. Listen to the words of this prayer and it will give you an idea of what we need to do to know God. That we need to reach out to him and say, God, I need your help. Sorry for not living for you and not acknowledging you in my life, but I invite you into my life. Come and help me because that's the essence of this prayer. So I just ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes and listen as I read it. It's Psalm 63. When David was fleeing to the wilderness of Judah to hide from his enemies, he wrote these words to God in his time of need. He said, O oh God, you are my God. I earnestly search for you. My soul thirsts for you. My whole body longs for you in this parched and weary land where there is no water. I have seen you in your sanctuary and gazed upon your power and glory. Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. I lie awake thinking of you, meditating on you through the night, because you are my helper. I sing for joy in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your strong right hand holds me securely. But those plotting to destroy me will come to ruin, and they will go down into the depths of the earth. They will die by the sword and become food for the jackals but the king but the king the king will rejoice in God all who swear to tell the truth will praise him while lies will be silenced Lord God we thank you for your word we come before you this morning and draw towards you intimately vulnerably Acknowledging our need for you. We lack, but you are sufficient. We're faithless, but you are faithful. In you is everything we need. You are the source of all things. And so we bring all things to you today and acknowledge you as our helper, as our all sufficiency. We ask for more of you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.